Many months ago here on the YouTube channel, I said, you know, it'd be great if someone did an experiment, got real data, real observation to find out which is faster, a communion rail or a communion line. As you know, before the 1960s, before the reforms of Vatican II, it was universal in the Catholic Church to receive at an altar rail kneeling and the priest came by like a typewriter and distributed Holy Communion. And then after the 1960s, it became pretty much the norm everywhere for everyone to queue up into lines and to receive Holy Communion. Well, there is a, a YouTuber named Ray Grijalba. Did I get that right, Ray? You got it. Okay. He took up the challenge and he collected a bunch of data from online masses, EWTN, Father Heilman, others. We're going to show some of that today. And he did, I mean, this is meticulous research showing the times, the different priests, trying to, you know, keep everything organized because you can't just, you know, use a priest here and a priest there. Uh, so priests who are doing the communion line and then later on EWTN doing an ultra rail. It's very fascinating. So before we pray, I'd like to welcome Ray Grijalba. How are you, Ray? I'm doing great, Dr. Marshall. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I've, I've actually had, had you, watched some of your videos before you did this video. And I was like, I like this guy. Ray gets on with his wife, and they have very nice videos. The, the YouTube channel is? The Joy of the Faith. The Joy of the Faith. The Joy of the Faith. So I'd seen some of your stuff before. And then when you released this video, everyone on Twitter was like, Marshall, have you seen this? Marshall, have you seen this? This guy did it. So I watched it and immediately reached out to you. So we're going to go through your research today. You know, it's today. funny, Dr. Marshall, yeah. real quick. I thought it was, you know, I tweeted it to you, and I was like, man, it, I, I just hope he'd retweet the video. or the video. And then you're like, hey, you want to come on the channel? I was like, heck yeah, you know? <laughs> so awesome. it's pretty awesome. Awesome. Okay, well, we're going to open in prayer. We'll pray the, the Our Father, and Ray's going to pray the second half, and then we'll, we'll jump into what Ray discovered. In nomine Patris et Fidii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster, qui est in celi, sanctificator nomen tuum. Adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum de nobis odie, et debeti nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationum, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. Nomini Patris et Fidii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Ray, I think we'll begin by maybe playing the video. But before you give away which one's faster and, and any of the details, is this something that you were interested in before? I mean, how did you get this idea? Because this was a lot of work that you did here. Yeah, yeah, totally. So before I say anything, I want to note, because you even see it in the comments where it's like, it's not about speed. You know, people people say, Good you point. know, is this the Indy 500 or whatever? Right. And uh, <laughs> this is, this is, I would wait double, triple the length of time just to see our Lord received in a reverent way. You know, like the oh, God of the universe is coming down to receive us. And, uh, you know, like you said, with the Grover shirt, right? Can you imagine that? It's, it's so amazing to have the rail and spoiler alert, the alt rail is faster. So <laughs> if you were like, I want to see if this is like good or not, you know, keep watching. Right. So, but pretty much last June, I started to look into this. I don't know when uh, you did the Taylor Marshall challenge, you know, mm -hmm. you know, there was like the ice bucket challenge. Yes, this is right. like the Taylor Marshall. Yeah. 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 So um, I've actually recorded at our FSSP parish because they have a, you know, a, a 10 a.m. Latin mass and then like a 5 p.m. English mass. Had a tripod set up and I actually like recorded it. And, um, and they let you do that? I lost that video. Uh, I didn't ask <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I didn't tell. So I guess it was like divine providence for right. me losing the video, you know. Right. So, uh, but it was pretty cool. I was, I, I guess I looked a little suspicious with like a tripod, you know. Right. And uh, so that was pretty funny. But. So in June, I started looking to see um, kind of Latin mass versus English mass. And that's when I got into, which we'll go into later, is there's a method, almost a form that, you know, is in the Latin mass, you know, the Corpus Domino Nostri Jesu Christi prayer that is not in the, the Novus Ordo. Right. So that kind of will go into in a little bit. But I've been interested in this for a while because you always hear, oh, you know, we'd love to use the rail or we could use the rail, but it's so much longer. Right. And it's like, is it really? I'm a, you know, I studied materials engineering, so I'm really into numbers and uh, data. That's pretty much all I've done. I work for Lockheed Martin and like the last two years, I've just been Excel sheet, you know, crazy, you know? Um, so to see what is the truth behind that and uh, we'll get into that in this video. So good. So you took your engineering mind and applied it to liturgy. Definitely. Yeah. Cause and you know, I, 
I like to approach things in an unbiased way. Like there's always like an idea behind it. I was really, I was going to really going to be afraid if, you know, I did this and the ultra was longer, I guess not afraid, but like kind of bummed, like, man, this kind of thing. Right, you know? right. Um, but I was amazed to see that it was faster and not just like a millisecond faster. It's, you know, a considerable amount. So. <clears throat> yeah. Because like you said, everyone, well, everyone knows that the old original way that's more reverent is the ultra rail. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Monsignor Chuck says, well, we love to do that, but it just it just takes so much longer. And this sort of yeah. pulls the carpet out beneath that argument. You can't use that anymore. Exactly. Yeah, it's great. It's brilliant. OK, so let's uh, let's go ahead and put it up and uh, I'll run the video and then we'll do this sort of like uh, NFL play by play. Uh, well, All right. Well, uh, we'll just kind of go through it and then I'll pause and I'll, I'll get your commentary on it. So. Let me see if I can cue this properly. All right, here we go. So you can see right away that Ray has these like these timers here on the screen. It's pretty, pretty. How long did it take you to edit this video? Uh, it took about 30 hours. I was going to say, this is a lot of work. So, yeah, there were two nights where I slept one hour oh the whole goodness. night because I was sitting here. Cause you know that the little timer, you know, the count, whatever. Yes. I literally was watching the video and clicking on my, you know, mouse pad. One, two, three. Right. So, and then I, and then I'd mess up uh -huh. and then I have to redo it again. So the, there's a 46 minute video of just like the raw footage. Right. So if there's 46 minute, minutes edited, that means I had to do that hours cause I had to watch the video to make sure it lined up and everything. Yeah. So it was a lot of fun. Right. Okay, so let's watch it from here. You are explaining it. Let me turn the volume up. And if you're tempted, all right. Do you the notice uh, the intro song? I did. That's that's the uh, that's the Ponje Lingua from uh, Thomas Aquinas. But we also that begins every new St. Thomas Institute video. So I did. I actually took that from your video. Okay. So I hope you're not <laughs> you, mad took, at me. you took it from my video. <laughs> well, I you actually took it from Thomas Aquinas, so I can't be upset at all. But, okay. But okay. Uh, I, I immediately, you know, funny, I actually, of course, notice that because I hear that I hear that every single day. Okay, so yeah. I'm gonna. You know, it's funny. Real quick, yep. I actually used that also in a, a video I made for my sister receiving her first communion. Okay. And you should have heard the song that they were actually singing in the church. It was horrible. Oh, so no. it was to replace it with you know the Ponje Lingua. You, you know, it's kind of while we're talking about that. So that's that's the Ponje Lingua, and it's a you know when we started New Saint Thomas Institute uh, seven years ago, uh, that song's playing and then you see like the crest of the new St. Thomas Institute sort of like spin in. Are you familiar with that? Have you seen that, Ray? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, woo, woo. Yeah, it goes, woo, 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 and it spins in. And so I was talking to the guy who edited it. I was like, that's really great. Where did you get the, the spin actually almost like matches it? How'd you get that? And he was like, well, you really want to know? I was like, yeah. He's like, I went into the sound stage and I got a, um, an extension cord and I just put a mic near it and I would, it's like I just swung it around till I got it right. Yeah, so that, that sound is just an <laughs> that's extension hilarious. cord. Yeah. Wow. So, that's impressive. The secrets. Okay, so yeah. I'm going to run this, Ray. Here we go. All right. All right. Ultra rail versus communion line. There's Father Mike Schmitz. Yep. What's faster? You we actually kind of named my son after him, so. Line. That's a I've different story. The most comprehensive study to date, with over 500 people who've received one of the two ways, and the results show that the altar rail is faster. But most importantly, it's more reverent, which I'll get into later. And if you're tempted to stop the video, I want you to know that I'm making this for the good of the church. I believe that by using the altar rail, we'll see a dramatic increase in belief in the true presence. And before we go further, please subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified for future content. Here we content, go. Everybody like follow his... at work, How to follow along in the Latin Mass and much more so let all right me... i'm gonna pause here so y you said you know part of this is reverence and you put a headline up uh and it, it's the headline that we're you know that we're most of us are familiar with and that is that a majority of american catholics do not believe in the real presence of christ in the eucharist body blood soul divinity yeah how sad it's, you know it, it I, is probably uh... the you know i mean you can look, put up, you know, what do Catholics believe about abortion and contraception and all that. But belief in the Eucharist is just bedrock, basic. I mean, we're not Catholic if we don't believe in that, you know. 
Yeah. It's like, what, what else are we here for? So, so, you know, the whole like sacramental system ties towards that. Exactly. If we don't believe that this is truly Jesus, why go to confession? Right. You know, why not use contraception? Why try to be a saint? If it's just, if it's just a symbol, let's just like not go to confession and go to communion every time, you know? Sure. And, so, and, and, and Ray really said, sad. we'll do some Q and A at the end. Uh, and maybe one of the questions we can handle is does kneeling versus standing or on the tongue or in the hand, do these things have a negative consequence for our beliefs? I think we should maybe maybe talk about that towards the end, but we'll keep going on the video here. I'm gonna resume it. Great. Oops. I've had a faster time priest. All right, here it is, Further, sorry. Please okay. subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified for future content, like how to witness at work, how to follow along in the Latin mass, and much more. So let's begin. Quick shout out on that. The how to follow along the Latin Mass I'm putting out today, you know, like right after this video. So. Oh, wonderful. Okay, we'll plug it at the end. All right. In line, we have to keep two things constant. One, the priest, as speak and vary by the priest, as you see here. And two, the method, which I will get into later. When researching, I found five EWTN priests that used the altar rail during one Mass and a communion line in the other. As a result, I timed how long each took. After the analysis, I saw that all five had a faster time when using the altar rail. In fact, one time decreased by over two seconds per person. Their average time with the communion line was 4.78 seconds. I love this baseball stat here. So Father Mark Mary, for communion line, he's 5.01 versus 4.31. This is seconds per communicant. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then Father Anthony Mary is 5.21 versus 4.85. Father Joseph Mary is three. He's fast. 3.95, 3.82. Father Pascal Mary, communion line four, altar rail 3.36. He's got a nice. Can you imagine 3.36? He is flying. Yeah. He's good. He is. And you know, I want to say it is unreal how difficult it is to find videos of, you know, just mass recorded where the camera is stationary. Because even in these videos, if you look at like the 46 minute video, they're constantly changing camera angles. Right. So what I had to do was literally like when the body of Christ would touch the tongue or the hand of the person, that's when the time started and stopped. Okay. So whenever they change a camera angle, I would have to go from like it going in one person's hand, replacing the image with the next person with it in the hand and then continuing that Got time. You. Wow, that's, so, that's a lot of work. So, yeah. so these times yeah. are actually communion reception to communion reception that's how you're timing it yeah so yeah the, so, our lord hits the tongue and then the very next one the lord hits the tongue or hits the hand that's how you're doing it yeah so it'd be you know for father pascal four seconds flat <laughs> and then 3.3 seconds from tongue to tongue or hand to hand gotcha um and this also factors in the line you know walking back and forth mm -hmm. you know if you have a shorter you know if you if you only go 10 feet instead of 20 feet yep. your time is going to decrease because you're not walking as far that's factored in as well right right which is not a problem so. on the rail because people are situating themselves pretty tight on the rail while father's communicating others exactly that's probably exactly. the main difference that's oh yeah that's, yeah and what's cool is is that it, ew10 provide it provides a way for you to find these five priests uh, distributing in both modes. Exactly. That's the key. Yeah, it, it is the key. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of priests out there that do use, well, maybe not a lot, but there are priests out there that use the altar rail. They just don't record their mass. You know, like Father Heilman's, his mass is recorded. So right. that's how you could tell. But EWTN, they've got their cameras back there all the time, and that was pretty much stationary. So um, even with that, these these footage, like the footage of them mm -hmm. using, a, uh, using the line and the rail, those were the only clips I could find. Okay. So, because I, I would like to have had, you know, a greater sample size. Right. But we still had, you know, several hundred people. So it's, it's significant. Yeah. So it looks like, um, yeah, Father Pascal Mary, he's he's the big winner. You know, if this was like a ESPN show or whatever, we'd do a little highlight session on him. He's yeah. got the 3.36 on the oh, altar yeah, rail. Top 10, you know? Yeah, he'd get first round pick draft. Exactly. In the, uh, in the mass. Okay. And then we got Father Miguel Marie. He is mm -hmm. communion line 573. He's the slowest. He's, he is, but you see that gap? Yeah, the but then path. he's at altar rail three point. He's almost as fast as Father Pascal Mary. Yeah. 
He's three point four two. You know, on that one, there were because um, there's always situations where you know someone's in a wheelchair mm-hmm. or something like that, or right. someone's just really slow. That's the challenge with the comedian line: is your your weakest link is your slowest person. Yeah. With ultra rail, your weakest link, I guess, if you could say that, is just the priest. So typically, right. there there won't be a challenge there. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you get all that variation once you add in hundreds of people mm-hmm. with different speeds and whatnot. Yeah, and you know a common question that comes up, and I'm sure people are asking it in the in the comments now because it comes up always, and that is, well, I can't kneel. I've had a knee injury. I had a surgery. I'm elderly. I'm in a walker. I'm in a wheelchair. Never a problem. Yeah. It's never a problem. I've been attending never. Latin Mass for over ten years. Almost every Mass, even at the daily Mass. There is someone in a walker or a kneeler or someone who just comes to the rail and doesn't kneel because they can't. And Mm -hmm. sometimes these are younger people because of a surgery or an injury. No one judges them. We all know what's going on. They can't kneel. No big deal. They can either come up to the rail and father will lean forward a little bit more or they'll go to the end of the rail and father will kind of come out a little bit and communicate them in their wheelchair. No problem. Exactly. Never a problem. None. Yeah. Yeah. That was, you know, probably one of the biggest comments that I got is, oh, I can't kneel. And it's like, yeah, that's fine. We totally get that. Yeah. You know, that's, that's just life, you know? Yeah. We, we have a, we have a solution for that. So the average times here for communion line is, is 4.78 seconds per person and the altar rail is 3.95. So not quite a second. But, yeah, but, but that's but still a pretty, I mean, <laughs> so I've got my calculator out here, Ray. And let's just say you have a thousand people. That's a thousand, you know, let's just say round it to a thousand seconds. That comes out to 16 minutes. You know, maybe if we round it down a little bit here, 15 minutes, 15 minutes for a thousand people, folks, 15 minutes. So the argument that the ultra rail is slow or whatever is completely bogus. And, And what's amazing is, is did you have any examples of priests and we're going to look at some more in just a minute, folks. Anyone who was actually slower on the ultra rail, or was it universally faster on the ultra rail? No, it was universally okay. faster. Right. That's the thing that I was most surprised about. I thought I was going to see maybe one mm-hmm. priest that was slower with ultra rail, but every single one of them was faster. Okay, great. Okay. So that was amazing. All right, let's keep going here. Per person. All right. And with the ultra rail, their average was 3.95 seconds per person. If you want to see that footage and how I got those numbers... There's like a 14 minute segment on just this portion that you can see in the link above. Also, if you're enjoying this video, please share it with others. The more people that see this, hopefully the more desire there will be to bring back the altar rail. Unfortunately, that was pretty much as far as I could go because a lot of priests don't use their communion rail, although Father Richard Heilman did. So I also looked at his time. He's the only priest I could find and his average was 3.61 seconds. So we see that there's definitely speed with the altar rail. Then to further approach this, I want only priest I could find. So let's see. Uh, Father Howman was three point what was it again? Let me see if I can he was. Uh, let me pull it up. I could find, and his average was three point six one seconds. So three point six one. Three point six. Yeah. So and again, we're not. So we're again, not saying faster is better average. because of efficiency. We're just saying that the argument that it's slower has been debunked. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Definitely speed with alter rail. Then to further approach this, I wanted to see if their average altar rail time would surpass the average communion line time for other priests. It just so happens that we have five American Cardinals, so the five EWTN priests would have a fair comparison. Again, Oh, this is bringing out the big guns. We're going Cardinals here. I know. I love this so much. I love this so Cardinals much. Cardinals' average time to distribute communion <laughs> was higher than the altar rail average time. Although... Okay, so let's see here. Oh, I'm going to let you go concluding that using an altar rail is faster. However, I think that while seeing which one's faster, I'll go back to those numbers. So Cardinal DiNardo on communion line is 3.92. I'm guessing these Cardinals have no data on kneeling at a rail. Am I correct? Oh, no. All of them do. They do? They really love the rail. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I was like, whoa, blowing my mind. Yeah, I I imagine you can't find any video footage of them distributing communion at a a rail because they don't play like that. But... Denaro's no, 3.92. I'm too. sorry. Go ahead, Ray. I actually looked for, for the rail with them, too. Um, Cardinal Dolan and Cardinal uh, Supich were pretty easy to find videos on because they have, like, their diocese has, you know, 
website or their, their YouTube channel with all their videos. But literally Cardinal Donardo and Cardinal O'Malley, there is one video on YouTube, one video like everywhere that I could find on YouTube of them actually distributing communion. So it was pretty challenging to find. Okay. All right. So Donardo's 392, Dolan's four, Tobin is, Tobin is slow. He is slow. 448, he's a big boy. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah. 448. Okay. Supich. Is that, is that high? Supich is rapid. He is. He's a little guy. Maybe you should that's have seen it. him. You should have seen him go. Man, he was just like he was he was like the typewriter, you know. Yeah. Okay. And then Cardinal O'Malley, he's he's three eight two. So even here, when we get the Cardinal communion line, they're faster than the other guys. I guess maybe to be a Cardinal, you gotta be fast. Well, I'm guessing it's more like the Cardinal saying math. So all of our lines are efficient and we've got all these ushers and whatnot. Good point. Yeah, they've got they've got more infrastructure maybe at these cardinal masses. They do. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of I was a little hesitant in using that, but I said, Hey, this is you know, this is the best it'll get if you if you think about it. Gotcha. Because a lot of the videos I saw, like one one it was actually a bishop, it's in the other video, he was six seconds per person. That's you know? Yeah. And uh, so it just shows really logistics are a big part of it. Cause you know You've been to those masses where, you know, you're in like that back section and everyone's confused as to where to go. Surely that's going to increase that time. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, a thousand times an extra three seconds is 3000 seconds. Do the math. That's a lot. But what's interesting is oh, yeah. the Cardinal communion line is still slower than EW10 or Ultra Rail. That's the point. Yeah. And that's, and that's really big because they're faster than EWTN mm -hmm. communion line. Right. Which again, before going back to the, the, the Cardinals and all that stuff, but they're still, cause I mean, you probably couldn't get better than this cause they're in, you know, cathedrals and whatnot. Everything's lined up perfectly Ushers. and uh, it's still faster. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So, Just amazing. Yeah. All right. I'm going to keep, I'm gonna keep running. Here we go. Although all right. very close concluding that using an ultra rail is faster. However, I think that while seeing which one's faster is great. This is not the reason I recommend using the ultra rail or even why I made this video. The altar rail is so much more reverent and requires us to reflect a moment before we receive God while the priest is coming towards us. It's amazing. I mean, I've literally watched hours of people in communion lines and altar rails, and you can just see the difference in reverence. I highly recommend that you check out the reverence yourself. Again, the link is above. Now, critics of this conclusion may say that, you know, the time is slightly faster, but you're limited by how long the altar rail is or how many ministers you can have. And yeah, that's definitely true. But to my previous point, what's more important, getting out of mass a couple minutes earlier or by our actions showing that we believe that the body of Christ is Jesus himself. Finally, you may be wondering why I didn't just compare the Latin mass to an English mass. Well, that goes to number two, which is the method. Let's look at the difference. In the ordinary form, the Novus Ordo, the priest Here, Dr. Marsh, can we pause it real quick? Yeah, I'm gonna pause it. Go ahead. All right. So before we go into the distinction between the Latin and the English math, I want to really point out, because I'm sure the question will be, and someone actually like went back and forth and be like 20 comments about the, you know, the amount of ministers that you can have, right? And obviously uh, on this channel, <laughs> Eucharistic ministers have been talked about often. And I think that there's definitely that abuse. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> it's like, unless you have hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of people, what, what is the, the use of it, you know? Um, I'm sure you've been to conferences where it takes like 30 minutes to distribute communion. Mm -hmm. And is that the end of the world? No. no. You know, if, if anything, like you get, you get more prayers in, you know, yeah. and really that we talked about the whole concept of Thanksgiving after mass. What, what perfect time to do that than, than now, yeah. you know, like my, my priest, for instance, at our parish, he, he's the only one that distributes communion. Right. So if there were two or a deacon or whatever that came in, it would be twice as fast, but that has never, that has never made me want to go to a different church or something like that, because I'm not there just to get out fast. I'm there to, uh, you know, worship God and to, you know, be give of myself in Thanksgiving for, you know, all that he's done. So that's a point that I wanted to point out. And then also I thought it was cool when, when you like look at the reverence, it is amazing to see the altar rail. Obviously we know this cause you know, we, we go to the altar rail every Sunday. Um, but you see the line, like the communion line, and people are like smiling and giggling on the way up to, to communion. And uh, it's obviously, you know, we're not like judging them, 
or whatnot. But it's it's unfortunate because like you're about to receive God and you're just like laughing and snickering and high fiving people and peace of Christ and people and it's really it's kind of a bummer to see. And I know even myself, um, you, you could obviously have that in line for the for the altar rail as well, but you don't see that as much. And I think it's there are two things that I think would like change the the belief in the true presence. One, altar rail and two stand the mass at orientum yeah. you know those would those would be game changers and i think that uh you see a lot more of this i actually was with um father dwight langenecker this past weekend and he uh he's actually using an altar rail well he's he's using an altar like it's just a step okay. and he put a little pad down because his bishop wouldn't let him have a rail and it's so much faster he said he said uh now i'm putting up a disability rail it's not gonna be called an altar rail <laughs> And I was like, what is the bishop going to think? And he's like, I'm not going to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see now it's on the video. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the disability rail. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and you said something um, about the, the reverence and the preparation. For, at, at our parish at Modern Day in Irving um, or at St. Benedict's in Fort Worth, both fraternity of St. Peter parishes, you go up to the rail and there's a moment there where you're kneeling and you're looking at the altar of sacrifice. There's the candles. There is the, the haze of incense. Um, I'm often just overcome by the beauty of the altar and the crucifix there. And I like to, mm -hmm. to stare at the crucifix and talk to our Lord. And then you kind of in your periphery see the priest moving in. And then the altar boy slips the communion patent under your neck and you receive and it's it's so powerful and moving it is. and if you compare it to the other way you're standing in a line looking at the back of someone's head mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden boom body of christ you know there's there's not that sort of moment where you get to prepare to receive the body of christ um and i think that's a big difference the other thing that i've noticed in novus ordo context and this I mean, this is worse than like snickering or talking, whatever. And that is, they come up, and the, the priest or deacon body of, or Eucharist, whatever, body of Christ, and people do this, then they do this, which is horrible, right? And then they they roll right or left and walk off. And as they're walking off, they place the body of Christ in their mouth. They're actually walking. They're moving as yeah. they receive Christ. This is a grave abuse. You should not be, you know, drive through Holy Eucharist walking. I mean, even at our house, you know, usually if it's an if it's an important day, we eat in the dining room seated. If it's a normal dinner, we'll eat at our kitchen table, all of us. And then if it's a Friday night or people over, we have sort of like a kitchen or breakfast. We have like a kitchen bar, you know. But it's mm -hmm. never okay in our home to just sort of stand in the kitchen and like hold a plate and eat your dinner. No, that's no, not that's such a bummer. Communal. It's not, it's not no. even reverent. So the fact that you would take our Lord and walk off, and not only is it irreverent, you can have witches and warlocks and Satanists walk off, put it in their pocket. Put it exactly. My, put it into a little uh, family lived in pocket, you know, right here, and they just stole a host for for an occult black mass or whatever. Yeah, and my my family lived in Oklahoma, where Satanism was really big. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess in the nineties or whatever, and they actually had ministers to watch. I guess minister, whatever people to watch people receive communion because there were so many people walking off with a host. Yep. And what a sad thing that is, you know. I've heard. I don't know if it's true. Could you confirm this? If the body of Christ touches your tongue, they can no longer use it for satanic practices. Have you heard that? Mm, no, I don't. Is that one of their rules? I, I don't know if I heard it listening to Father Chad or something like that. Okay. So, but I'll have to look it up. I've never heard out, that before, but, but I mean, I mean, even if they if they were trying to steal a host that way, I mean, saliva would immediately begin to, to break down the accidents okay. of the host. Exactly. So it would make it more difficult for them. I don't know if that's one mm -hmm. of their rules or not, but... Yeah, I mean it's it's near impossible to steal a host at a rail, and exactly. you've got the altar boy with the paten. You got people on your right and your left, so. and it's such a bummer to see. Uh, like you mentioned before, how you chase people down that you know yep. we're still holding the body of Christ. I've done it myself. Yeah, my it's an chase. awkward thing, and it's really sad to think about because, especially like contamination, 
like where, where could the body of Christ have been if someone put it in their pocket or, you know, it's, it's crazy. But to go back to the altar rail, the reflection, I have a uh, identical twin boys. They're almost nine months old. They're awesome. And, um, when we go up and kneel at the altar rail, I don't know what it is, but they're just so calm. Like they're mm-hmm. not fidgeting or anything, you know, during the mass, they'll be fidgeting and you're trying to follow along in your missile or whatever. But it's like, at this point, it's, it's you know, I'm just going to focus on the mass. Yeah. But you go up at that altar rail and it's just like, they know something's different. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the altar server or the altar boy puts the, the patent underneath your chin and they're like, what is going on? And that's, that's a really amazing moment. Um, in addition to having that ability to reflect, we have a, a painting from, uh, I don't know, some famous painter or whatever from, from Italy. And it, it's the crucifixion. Mary, Jesus is looking at Mary, her face is away, and uh, John, the apostle, is looking down. And at the bottom of, like, you know, Jesus' feet, there's a pile of blood. You can only see that at the altar rail. You can't see that from where you're sitting. Mm. And I always think about that, and I'm like, wow. You know, to, to look at the face of Christ on the cross, on the cross, and then also, like, see him in the tabernacle, and the priest is coming towards you. It's such an amazing moment that you don't really get from your pew. You're, like, so close there, and, you know— even even just the, the altar boys kneeling there, you know, sometime with the with the torches, mm. it's just really cool. Like in that moment, to um, it's something transcendent. It's it's not like of this world. You know, you wouldn't see this in your average Protestant parish. Yeah, and it's uh, it's pretty amazing. And what a gift that we have. People have debated. You know, well, is reverence? Can you define? Can you say that something is more reverent than the other? Yes. And I'm like, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. Yes. You know, people try to make the argument. Yeah. That that it it isn't. And I'm like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Yeah. You know, like obviously we hear like the early church fathers that, you know, Augustine talking about, you know, reverencing Christ before you receive him. And mm-hmm. what more reverent of a way is there than kneeling before God? Yeah. So, yeah. Bishop- and also another thing real quick. I, um, I kneel when I receive, you know, the body of Christ at like another sort of mass or whatever. And it is a challenge to get up, you know, you know, you don't want to like trip someone behind you and you don't want to you know, kneel on someone's foot while they're going. So that's another benefit to the altar rail. Yep. So, yep. and then I've also, I don't know if you've ever been told to, or asked to stand up when, when you've knelt for communion <clears throat> at an episode parish. No, that is definitely like one of the worst things ever. It was like a couple of days before my birthday. And this, this priest, he was probably like, he was probably in his late eighties and he was like, stand up like everyone else. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I did it, but I just like bawled. For like 10 minutes afterwards so i was like this is so sad like i can only imagine yep. people from you know you know fraternity parish coming to you know nova soda mass and having that experience like especially when it's like all are welcome it's like it's, unless you kneel for communion then you're not welcome you know right. so it's it's definitely a, a tragedy but you know thanks be to god that the altar rail is becoming more popular yeah yeah bishop athanasius schneider who was on last week he talked about uh how important it is that when we receive communion, it is different. You know, we don't, we don't go to Olive Garden and when the food comes, get on our knees next to the table and have the waiter put the spaghetti and meatballs in our mouth. We, no one does that. You don't do that. I do that. <laughs> yeah. The, the <laughs> only mode in which that actually happens in human society is children and parents. And he off, he brought up, I hadn't thought of it either. Lovers, will feed each other. You're on a date and you go, oh, this this uh, steak is amazing and the salmon's amazing and you you feed your wife across the table. You wouldn't you wouldn't do that with your buddy. Like, oh man, this fish and chips is amazing and like feed your friend. <laughs> you're, you're a guy, right? It's, it, there's an intimacy there yeah, yeah, yeah. that's familial. You know, I would only do that really with my wife and my children because we're a family. And, and Bishop Schneider brought that up and he said, this is why in the Roman Rite, we do it this way, or well, they do it in the Eastern Rite as well. Um, you are fed by your sacerdotal father. There's real significance there. And, and kneeling, a seven-year-old is not going to read the Summa Theologiae of Thomas Aquinas. You know, they, I don't even fully understand the miracle of transubstantiation. I don't even have like a 15% appreciation of the miracle of transubstantiation. I read all the articles on the Summa on the on the Eucharist, right? Mm-hmm. But for a seven year old, and even for me, to kneel before the Eucharist is a theology lesson in itself. Exactly, exactly. You know, um, 
even so I, it, he's Bishop Adam is probably the most uh, the greatest advocate for it. You know, I remember him saying on EWTN, his mother was like, oh my gosh, they're receiving this like it's a cookie, you know? Yeah. And that is really profound, especially in his accent, you know? <laughs> right. It's, um, you know, even even the concept of kneeling, how many times do you drop something on the ground and you have like your son or daughter there that's lower to the ground and you're like, hey, can you pick that up? Right. We don't like to kneel down, right. you know? It's not a pleasant thing. Yeah. And to, to do that, something that's so unique, um, is, is really profound. I think Christine Niles from Church Militant, she said that one of her friends was Protestant. She came to a Catholic mass and saw everyone kneeling at the communion rail and knew this is something different. And she ended up becoming Catholic. Yeah. She, so what a way to see. She speak. got an, like an instant Thomas Aquinas catechesis by seeing that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, I want to like share Sarandi, a story. Right? I want to share a story that, that someone, uh, recently shared with me he he watches the channel and and uh we met up for lunch recently and he knows a priest he was in the church uh i think it was at night but anyway it was completely dark in the church and he was going you know into the sacristy and as he was moving he saw these like little pinpoints of light in the church kind of flickering so he went to look have you heard this before I've heard something very similar. Okay. So he went, he's like, what's going on here, right? So he went and looked in or around the altar area and where people receive communion, he found several little particles of the Lord's precious body. And they oh. were emitting light to notify him. And when he saw this, he was cut to the heart and he's like, Lord, no more. Mm. Bring in the communion wow. patents. This has to stop because little particles you know, the church teaches us that even in the smallest particle of the Lord's body is the full Christ, the full person, mm -hmm. body, blood, soul, divinity. It's all there, even in the smallest, small. That's why even, you know, in, in last rites, if a person's dying and they can barely, you know, they can't chew, sometimes the, the priest will give them a small particle, you know, just so they can receive wow. the body because the full Christ is there. So... This priest was basically given a vision and the Lord notified him and he saw these little, these sort of twinkles in the sanctuary and they, they were his body. They weren't in the tabernacle. They were on the floor being desecrated. Wow. You know, I think that that's also a, you wonder why the, so many people in the church like aren't on fire for Christ. Mm. And I think that a lot of it goes back to that, that belief in the true presence. If we truly believe right we would we would do everything we could to keep his body most revered. Yes. And I think that that's where again, like what's the point of a patent if you're you know, if you're not distributing on the tongue right. and at the altar rail. So right. I think that that's why I think the altar rail is going to be a game changer. Mm -hmm. Cuz I've been to Nova Soto parishes that have used the altar rail and those parishes are on fire. Yeah. Um it's it's unreal to see it. The, the masses are packed. I even saw like one of the altar servers or the altar servers were wearing gloves and they weren't even touching anything sacred. So it's really cool to see how all these things tie together. Yep. And uh, I hope that, that this video and all that, that you're doing, it will help bring the church back to that love of Christ. Because people even ask me, what, what was the, before we took out our altar rails, what was the belief that you present? And I don't know the numbers, but I've heard it's higher. Yes, <laughs> you know? it, was, it was in the 90%. And yeah. you, if you go back to the time of Joan of Arc, Catholics in Europe were probably 90 plus percent illiterate. Mm -hmm. Couldn't read. Hand them a Baltimore catechism, they'd look at the pictures. Could not read. And yet, if you polled them, I don't have any proof for this, but my suspicion is if you polled, polled them, over 98% would have believed in the real presence of the Eucharist. So much so that they were, you know, in mass moving and twisting their necks and arcing so that they could see the elevation. That was the, you know, they were so intent on that to see God mm. in the mass. And so here are illiterate people who have their hearts burning on fire with faith and charity towards the Eucharist. We need to get back to that. And that's what we need. And, and exactly. look, part of it is education, you know, making, you know, videos like you're doing Ray and like what I'm doing. And part of it is, you know, good catechesis and reading books. But look, even in a literate culture, we need to recognize that signs and 
and all these things, liturgy, devotions, icons, statues, images, these things have a profound impact on our interior life. You know, you look at it right is. now, like pornography, which is destroying so many people's lives. It's looking at images and it's creating so much disorder and, and disaster in a person's interior life. Look at the church is defended, especially since the eighth century, looking at holy things, looking at beautiful sacred images, Our Lady the crucifix, the saints. These things also change the soul, but for the good. They actually do sanctify us. We, we Catholics don't just have statues because we think we're, they're pretty. They are. We actually believe that they're windows to heaven and that grace is actually given to us and communicated to us through the images. Hmm. That's why the Eastern Orthodox, when they when they create icons, they're fasting, they're praying. It's It's not just like doing art class. They're doing yeah, something sacramental. Something really cool about the icons. I, my um, brother-in-law is uh, just became Melkite, and um, we went to his parish, Holy Transfiguration, in Virginia or something like that. And I was saying, oh, I think I've been I to that one. Oh, it's yeah, really Mel cool. Yeah. It's, a, it's an amazing parish. So I said, uh, I always say the Confidior, whatever mass I'm at before I go to receive communion, just like they do at the Latin mass. And I was walking up to receive, and you know. Mary of a Virgin, Michael the Archangel, John the Baptist, Peter and Paul, and I could see the icon. Right. And I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so Catholic right now. You, you're like yeah. literally looking at the saints as you're about to receive like Jesus, you know? Mm -hmm. That was that was such a cool thing. And I, I think, again, we, we didn't really talk about um, icons and statues and stuff like that right. in this video. But another thing that points towards that, you know, you go to those parishes where it's just like a whitewashed wall and there's nothing really beautiful in it. And you can, you can feel the difference versus when you go to like a cathedral or something very beautiful church, very beautiful. So yeah. it's a, uh, it's a game changer to the point of, of belief in the true presence. Something I've wanted to do. I went and visited Lanciano this past uh, October. Yes. So um, I'm going to be making a video on that, like a scientific video. Good. Um, Tell people so, what that is. Cause and, a lot of people don't know what Lanciano is. Yeah. So uh, in the eight hundreds, there was a priest that was, uh, really struggling with belief in the true presence. And when he raised the host to consecrate it, it started to bleed. And it's uh, to this day, so over 1,200 years later, in a monstrance in Lanciano, Italy. And this, this city is like just a little city. It's nothing huge, just a side church, you know, on a street. Right. But it's amazing to see. And it was actually tested in, I think, the 80s. And, uh, you know, they found that it was heart tissue and stuff like that. So they actually have a little museum in there with the slides that they put the piece that was analyzed in and in Italian, all the results, my wife's dad's a cardiologist. So he's going to help me, you know, kind of translate this and uh, it's going to be, going to be pretty great. That's fantastic. So, I'm, I'm excited for that one. Uh, these videos take a while to make. So yeah. <laughs> that's why it's, it's going to be, you know, probably after Easter, but, and then for Easter, I'm making a, a video on the um, Shroud of Turin. I don't know if you knew this, Dr. Marshall, but it, it's been over 30 years since the Shroud of Turin research project. And uh, all the peer-reviewed journals are now free to the public. So you don't have to buy them anymore. So okay. pretty much taking that. Because you always, you know, you always find these atheists and they're like, give me a peer-reviewed journal. And it's like, that's hard to get. Because first of all, who's going to pay for that? Yeah. So these will be them. So cool. be on the lookout for that. And uh, it's just amazing, like, what God has given us and, like, our senses. That's, that's what I love being about Catholic. That's kind of a tangent. But being Catholic, all five senses are... Mm -hmm utilize in the mass right mm -hmm. you've got your smell to the incense you've got your touch to the the missile right and the pew and all those things yeah. time the cross taste with the body of oh, Christ. The holy water don't forget now. the holy water oh yeah you can't forget the holy yeah. water speaking of that you know the epiphany blessing yep epiphany Confessions. yep went to that for the first time this year and uh that is a long blessing the, the blessing so. of epiphany water it is yeah, i've yeah, never been like I, i'm a kind of ashamed to admit i never i never seen it yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, that was it's lost in the Roman Rite. It was. We lost it. Was. it. You know what? And then I think it was in the 18, I might be wrong on this, but I think it was in the 1800s that people in the Roman Rite were like, wait a second, we lost Epiphany water. Let's get it back. And so it was reinstated in the Roman Rite. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. Very. So.
All right, well, why don't we do some, you want some Q&A, Ray? Yeah, sure. Do you mind if we like hit the method real quick? Because that's a big thing oh, that yes. people ask about. Hit the method. So I, I can just talk that or we can play the video, whichever you want. Um, well, we already played the whole video. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. So why so don't you... As far as... Because I'd have to go find so the it. Method, yeah, yeah, no worries. So people say, why don't you just compare the Latin mass versus the English mass? Okay. And it's because the method is different. So right. in the Latin mass, you know, there's the corpus domino no, the, the prayer that he says before he, he gives you the body of Christ. So that, that could take up to five seconds to say, and he typically says that in between. Uh, in between I pre say in about two, it's fast. You know, I actually, the video that I'm putting up today, okay. it, it's actually like two and a half seconds. Yeah. So yeah. Still that, that, that adds some time. Right. So, uh, you but know, for example, it, it does seem that they're saying it. I mean, he's already usually halfway through it before he even gets to me. You know, like no, exactly. As soon as he places on one tongue, he's like starting in to, to the next. No, no, yeah. I, no, I, I, I want to see is, this video you're doing. It's gonna be cool. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So it adds. It was slightly slower with the altar rail when you would compare the same priest Latin mass versus English mass. Okay. Because there's, if he's halfway through and it only takes two seconds, it's still an extra second. Gotcha. So because of that, I compared apples to apples, right? Mm -hmm. Body of Christ, amen. Altar rail, body of Christ, amen. Right. Communion line. And, and that was a fair comparison. There were some priests that were faster. There was, uh, I went to, pulled a video of uh, Notre Dame in, in France. And there was a Latin mass priest that beat the altar or beat the communion line. He was that fast. So it was a different priest and a different method. So it really didn't right. okay. didn't count. But that's why you can't just compare and say, "Well, hey, the altar rail slower because this priest said mass here, and you know this priest used the line that was faster here." It's like there's a different variable right. in that. So yeah, just want to address that. Yeah, but yeah for sure. For Ready sure. for any questions? So yeah, let's let's do some questions now. When we do questions, uh, there's how many? We got uh, over 700 people with us right now. So it's it's hard for me because I'm talking with. Ray and all that. So when I look into the questions, if you can put a question mark or even like three question marks on there, I will see that you have a question and it's not just like, yeah, I love the Latin mass or pray for so-and-so. Uh, if you put the question marks, I'll see it and then uh, we'll feature your comments. So if you have a question for, for Ray or for myself or on this topic or maybe any topic related to the Eucharist or, or the liturgy, uh, we would be We'll be happy to to feel that. Oh, look at this. This is kind of great. Oh, this is so Father Z, Father Zolsdorf is with us today. I think Father Heilman's in the comments. All too. right. But Father uh Zolsdorf says this the blessing of Epiphany Water involves special exorcisms of the place of the blessing, the church, before blessing the salt and water. So that's pretty cool that you actually bless your environment before you even get to blessing the water and the salt. So uh Father Z, Father Zolsdorf. Thanks for teaching us that. I did not know that. And again, I've not actually attended the Epiphany uh, Water Blessing. How long did it take, by the way? Since we're talking about times, Ray, how long did it take for Yeah, the... it took like 30 minutes. 30 minutes, yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah, so we had, and, and we were holding both boys. Okay. I was surprised it lasted for 30 minutes. But wow. But I guess it was just really holy in there because they did that blessing of the church, you know? For sure, <laughs> for sure. Okay, so here's a question from uh, Teresa Nelson. And uh, she asked, Ray, maybe you can handle this one. Do you say amen at the rail? Like at, at the Latin mass? I'm yeah, I guess, I guess that's the difference. I mean, at the Latin mass, you don't because you're like this. Oh, I see. You're right. I, yes. So th people would say it. And you can actually see it in the clips where they're saying amen. Yeah. So, so that again, that could take, and time. maybe Teresa. So, in the Novus Ordo Mise that was a, that was an, uh, promulgated in 1969, the, the no, New Order of the Mass, Paul the Six, the lay people are supposed to say Amen before receiving Holy Communion. That's part of the ritual. Before 1969, 65, 62, and on back, the laity don't say anything. They merely are at the altar rail with their mouths open. Because it's, I think the idea is if you're receiving communion and saying amen, it's kind of, there's a little bit of a, a disconnect there. So just so you know, people, if you attend the traditional Latin mass, 1962 Missal or before, do not say amen. If it's the Novus Ordo, you do. The people who get confused by this are my kids. 
They've been basically raised traditional Latin mass. They never say amen. My son, Jude, was at a, a Novus Ordo, and they said, body of Christ, and he was just standing there. And like, the body of Christ. And like, are you Catholic? <laughs> yes. Are you going to say amen? Oh, man. <laughs> I had no idea. And then I was like, oh, That's okay, hilarious. I got to teach my kids. If you're ever at a Novus Ordo, you have, they want you to say amen. Or yeah. You're going to maybe get denied. To address that question in a different light, she might have wondered, when you say amen at the altar rail, does that impact the time? And just to, if anyone has that question, it wouldn't because in the communion line, you're saying amen as well. So there would be that time. The priest wouldn't give you the body of Christ until you said amen. So. Okay. Okay. Using the altar rail in the Nova Sordo. Right. You know, altar rail in the extraordinary form, you wouldn't. Good. Okay, this is an interesting question that we didn't cover, uh, Ray. This is from Fred. Should the time taken right. to give communion to the Eucharistic ministers be considered as well? So this is another thing. In in the traditional Latin Mass, uh, you know, after there's the, the confidior, the priest just comes down the stairs of the altar and starts administering communing, communion. In the Novus Ordo, from what I've seen is, the priest receives and then, you know, three to 20 people come forward and they there's this very slow process of all of them receiving communion and pumping the Purell, like the whole pre-communion situation. How long does that take? Well, real quick, Dr. Marshall, it's funny. We at our cathedral, we actually have Purell machines and it's silent in the church. So you can hear them go out and it goes, you know, and, oh. and I'm like, oh, man. So. But yeah, that's, that's a great question. Several people have posed that to me. And uh, I'm probably going to make a video on the abuse of the extraordinary ministers. Awesome. That, yes. So that one, I don't, I'll give you a date when I have that. But because um, I think these are two separate issues. They are related. But what I wanted to do is with everything constant, the priest constant, the method constant, the, the number of ministers constant, how much time does it take per person? Because that factors out everything. Right. Right. Then it's, then it's literally, this is, this is how long this takes. This is how long this takes. Mm -hmm. When you, when you start to factor in the ministers, yes, that would take a lot longer. So, mm -hmm. cause you know, say it's taking four seconds per person and you have 20 people, right? You're over a minute then. Yeah. So we, uh, in order to keep it, you know, the same, I didn't factor that in, but it would take longer. Now where, where the challenge would be also is you have a lot more vessels to clean. So, you know, you're Good giving point. out communion, right? So that takes however long per person. Then you have to clean all those extra vessels versus the Yeah, so maybe four. six chalices. Exactly. So, um, but that's where you could really kind of blow this thing up if you said, well, this is also a part of it. Because then people could say, well, you know, say at a, you know, extraordinary form where you're using the altar rail or wherever you're at, you only have four priests and they're able to have eight priests. So they're able to cut down that time by a factor of two. Then it's faster you know, to distribute to them and clean vessels and things like that, that, that would be uh that would really expand the purpose of that video. So I'm going to eventually do a study, hopefully in the next mm -hmm. couple of months on that abuse and see if it does add so much more time. Cause you know, if, if you're at like, you know, for example, the cathedral basilica was used and there were probably six priests at the altar rail, you know, yeah. in the, in the ordinary form, there were probably eight, so, because mm -hmm. they would, you know, would go halfway through the church or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, that's, that'll be something that I focus on later. But just, just for the purpose of this video, we just kept everything constant. Good. So, man, this, I can't wait to see your video. This is going to be great. All right. Here's, yes, a, here's another uh, question. Crux Ave says, is Holy Communion on the Tongue banned in America um, because of coronavirus? It's banned in Ireland. Uh, so I will uh, speak to that. Certain dioceses are banning communion on the tongue. And I asked, Bishop Athanasius Schneider about this last week, and he scoffed at it and said it's ridiculous. A, I think coronavirus is bogus and it's fake news. I even thought about trying to get coronavirus just to prove to everybody it's not bad. I just, I spent two weeks sick on flu A, and I was sick, man. Flu A is no joke. Mm -hmm. Coronavirus apparently is not even bad as flu A. I don't know. I think this is all fake news. Also, I think as soon as it starts to warm up here in March, April, and our sickness season subsides, this is all going to go away. I think this is all just a bunch of hype. That's my opinion. But that being said, I told Bishop Athanasius Schneider, the times in which a priest has touched my tongue in Holy Communion, 
maybe two or three times in 12 years. And I think every single one of those times would maybe be when I was traveling and I was at like a Novus Ordo and the priest just didn't know what he was doing. And I had my tongue out and he kind of did a weird invasion, you know, he didn't know. But if you, you go to the Fraternity of St. Peter or Society of St. Pius X, Institute of Christ the King, uh, a, pre, a diocesan priest who is trained like Father Zolsdorf or Heilman, uh, Hallwell, these guys, they never touch your tongue, ever. Unless you're doing it wrong like this, you're like making a ATM like slot like this, like, and he's got to like feed it <laughs> in there which is wrong, you should open your mouth wide and stick out your tongue. If you do that, he's able to do it without touching your tongue. And my kids do. Well, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't touch our mouth. There's zero contact between the priest and me. I've also had the same thing. But to the we were talking before we went live. I don't even know how parishes are still giving out the body of Christ. Right? They'll like ban the communion on the tongue. The, the blood of Christ, yeah. sorry. Yeah. They'll ban communion on the tongue, but then they'll be like, here's the chalice, <laughs> you know? It doesn't make sense. No, no. So, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people are, are, or a lot of places are getting rid of passing of the peace, shaking hands. We don't do that in the Latin mass anyway. So mm -hmm. that's gone. The chalice is not given to the, the faithful in the Latin mass with an exception. I do see it at the Latin mass. And that's for people who are have extreme allergy to gluten or to wheat. In those cases, I have seen priests administer the precious blood to the lady, but only in those cases. Um, and it can't just be like, oh, I'm kind of off gluten for Lent. You know, it has to be a real medical situation. Yeah, <clears throat> totally. So, um, yeah, so in the Latin Mass, you're not shaking hands. You're not receiving the chalice. And the priest's sacred digits are not touching your lip your tongue there is zero contact so good question i think let's see what else we got here uh man i've been getting this question more and more ray this is from ever john navia he says what should we what should we lay people do if a priest denies us the holy eucharist because we kneel particularly in the novus ordo what do you say ray Man. So I've actually, you know, you hear about these cases of, of the priest asking you to stand up. And if you don't stand up, he denies you. I have actually never heard of someone standing up and then receiving and then, or standing up and hit them not, you know, giving the body of Christ to them. Yeah. So the way, the way that I see it is, uh, I would rather stand and receive the body of Christ than reject him and well, not don't receive say reject because that's going to judge a lot of people, <laughs> right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if someone then, felt then, that uh, they shouldn't receive standing and they don't, they're not rejecting Christ, right? Yeah, I, I meant rejecting the priest. Oh, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, you hear about these cases. I've never heard of anything like actually being done, you know, when they have, you know, asked people to stand. I think it's, I think it's a crazy thing for a priest to like, he's supposed to be the spiritual father. And he says, stand up because you're being more reverent than everyone else. Right. Mm. There are like a few cases where like, I see an elderly priest and he probably can't bend over to give me the body of Christ. I'll stand in those cases. Right. But, uh, I would, you know, if, if I were in that situation, and I have been in that situation. I would just stand and receive. And then, you know, I'd like to talk. It'd be good to talk to them after and be like, hey, Father, I really had the right to kneel, you know, Cardinal Lorenzi and all that. Right. There's EWTM videos on that. Um, and maybe if he doesn't listen, then maybe write to the bishop. But we kind of hear that, or at least I, I've never heard anything actually being done about it. So maybe it's not worth that. But right. again, uh, we just got to pray for our priests, you know, because it's our praying and sacrificing that's going to, inspire them to be holy and, and, you know, the grace of our prayers to touch them and, and inspire them to be holy priests like Father Hollowell and, you know, Heilman and stuff like that. Yeah. So what would you do, Dr. Marshall? Uh, it's never happened to me. I've never had a priest tell me to stand up or anything like that. You know, like, you know, occasion, you know, I, I probably have to, I go to the Novus Ordo maybe one to 
four or five times a year. Usually I'm traveling. I'm in another country. There's no, I always like look up if I can find a TLM, but if there isn't one, I'll go and I kneel and they've never denied me. But if they did deny me, hmm, what would I do? I don't know. I don't know. I got to think more about it. I, I was talking to some friends about this recently and, and, um, Father Hallwell has spoken about this, and recently there's been this debate uh, in an Institute to Christ the King parish. I, th I think the diocese is Limerick, and the Bishop of Limerick said, everyone must receive in the hand. The Institute of Christ the King went to the bishop and said, can we have a dispensation? We do the Latin Mass. He said, no. This is a, my, What? I might have the story wrong, but he said no. And so the pastor explained that the people will not receive communion. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the bishop is flexing on it, but he had a point and that is in times past, I'm going to put something on the screen here. You won't see it, Ray, but yeah, um, I know. Yeah. I'm sorry. I wish I had the technology to do it, but historically no, I've, I've people receive communion really rarely. I mean, the 12th ladder, I mean, the, 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 um, ladder and council of 1215 said that we have to receive communion one time per year to be a Catholic in the Easter season. But historically, I put on the screen here, the poor Claire's, this is the Franciscan sisters, they only received communion six times a year. That was their rule. They wow. went to mass every day, but they only received the body of Christ six times per year. That's all they were allowed. The Dominican wow. sisters only received 15 times a year. And these would usually be on the feasts, you know? So the Feast of Our wow. Lord and the Feast of Our Lady. But otherwise, when they're going to daily Mass, the Dominican sisters, who I assume are holy, <laughs> you know, these nuns, are not receiving communion. The Third Order of St. Dominic, this is uh, what nowadays they'd call like secular Dominicans, but the Third Order, four times per year. St. Louis the Ninth, the, the King of France, Saint, he received six times per year. And wow. St. Elizabeth, I think this is St. Elizabeth of Hungary, received three times per year. So, I mean, you think about that, you know, like we, you know, we complain like, oh, man, I didn't, you know, I didn't get to re receive communion on Sunday. Well, I mean, it's the custom of antiquity. They always went to mass. And this is, I think, part of the problem that we have after Vatican II is we think going to mass is receiving communion. Our forefathers believed that going to Mass was witnessing the objective sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the redemption of the world. For them, that was... The, even St. Jerome, early on, we're talking like late 300s, he says in his time, it's the custom of the Greeks to communicate once a year of the laity, right? So, you know, this whole idea that and a lot of it comes from St. Pius X, who was a holy man. And he yeah. really said, you know, we need to have more frequent communion. Young kids need to start receiving communion, you know, not waiting to their teenagers at the age of reason, seven. And all that's good. I think that's great. But I think we need to get back to remembering the mass is an objective sacrifice of Christ. And that is mm -hmm. the merit of the mass. And then the gift and the outflow is communion, but it's not necessary. Right. Going in because. A lot of people th are in mortal sin. They've broken the Eucharistic fast. They're like, well, I'm going to be judged. I really need to go up and receive communion. No, you don't. You know what I've noticed? Hmm? If you go to a Hispanic parish, a majority of the church will not receive. Do you know why? It is. I think it's, and, and also, all of them will receive on the tongue. Yeah. I think it's, so my last name is Grijalba, right? So. My grandparents are from Mexico. I think it's a, uh, cause even my dad, he will not receive. And I mean, I don't know his soul, but I don't think he's in mortal sin. Right. But, um, I think it's just, they just have a really great reverence and love for the Eucharist and they realize what it is. Yeah. Uh, so that's, <laughs> I actually want to make videos like Hispanics, like Hispanics actually realize that it's the true presence. Cause even my grandpa, right. He's, uh, he's from the Bronx. He's, he's very similar to president Trump, but, uh, He's a little more tactful, you know, yeah. and, uh, and I love president Trump. So, but yeah, so he said, uh, he's like really not super deep theologically, but, but he said, you know, 
what blows my mind is there's no one in line for confession, mm-hmm. but everyone's in line for communion. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's really bad. a sad thing to see. Um, but I want to share one thing real quick, just to, just to reiterate the point that we need to pray for our priests, right? The priest that told me to stand up for communion. And then I did. And afterwards I, I, I was like crying for like a little bit. Cause I was like, so I was 22 at this point, right? right? Like here I am like on fire for the faith and a priest tells me to stand up and like embarrasses me in front of like the whole parish. So afterwards, uh, one of the other priests in the parish said, Hey, Ray, let's get together. You know, I'd like to get to know more about you. Um, and we were having lunch and he said, uh, Ray, the reason that I came to get you is I knew that this priest would, would do something like that. Cause mm. after he denied you communion, he bragged to me how he denied you or he told you to stand up and you were crying. And I was like, are you serious? You know? So, but it's, it's, it's good to know that there are priests out there that know their brother priests. Right. And that's why I really got to pray. Cause we want like, what a, what a sad thing it is for anyone that we know to like go to hell. Right. But that's why we got to pray because we never know. And, uh, especially for our priests, cause they have, uh, they, they got quite the challenge, especially today. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, father Zolsdorf writes a great comment here. He says, if a priest denies you when you kneel, don't make a scene. However, inform the Bishop in writing and cite Redemptionis Sacramentum 90. So everybody write mm. that down, put that in your Evernote. Put that in your on a piece of paper in your missile. That way you've you've got what to do. Father Zolstor says, "Don't make a scene. Contact the bishop and cite Redemptionis Sacramentum number ninety. I assume that's paragraph ninety. All right, let's take it. You got time for just a couple more, Ray? Oh yeah, I'm good for another hour. <laughs> okay, another hour. okay. I don't have an hour in me, but let's do it. I uh, Okay, let's see here. Uh, and by the way, Father Father Zulstorf, thank you so much for that. That's that's really good advice. Um, and now we all know what to do. We need to be contacting the bishop on these things too, even if they don't well, agree Father with us. Steve, they need they need to hear that people are are unhappy or or uh, are contacting them. At least at least make a ruckus. All right, let's see. Looking for question marks. Make sure y'all put the question marks in, folks. There was a good one in here. I don't see it now, but um. The lady asks, do lay Eucharistic ministers purify their digits after they distribute communion? Priests do. You'll watch them. They hold their their sacred digits over the chalice and the altar server will will pour um, water and wine over it. Therefore, cleaning their sacred digits of any particles of, of Christ. Do lay Eucharistic ministers do that, Ray? You know, I've seen it both ways. Uh, The answer that I would say is in general, no. Yeah. Um, But, but I have seen a couple instances where parishes will have like a little uh, cup of water and the extraordinary ministers will dip their fingers into it. And then, you know, so that is, that is like a, I I have seen that actually. It was like a clear vessel with like a gold top and they would, exactly. I've only seen that once though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's better. That's better than nothing. But right. at the same time, like if you're dipping it in, then the body of Christ is getting in there and then the diluted body of Christ is still touching other, you know, it's so. not good because the the way the priest does it in the traditional Latin mass is let's just say he has a tiny particle of our Lord on his finger or by his fingernail. He holds it over the chalice, the server pours the water and the wine all, and then he drinks it. So if there was a particle of our Lord, he consumes it properly. But if it's just a little dish, you have you could have several particles in there just sort of dissolving. Or what if there was a particle in there and you put your fingers in there and the particle got on your finger and that you walked off? Exactly. I mean, this is not good. No. This is not good. Don't like it. Mm-mm. Let's see here. Okay. Ah, this is good. Todd, I've been thinking a lot about this, Todd. Todd says, question, 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 question. I like that. I saw it. Restoring communion for the lady outside of mass as common practice. So I didn't know this, but I was reading um, about practices like in the 1800s on a Sunday morning at the parochial mass, the main mass, the high mass. It was very common in Europe and especially in America that the high mass would would go as usual. The priest would communicate 
as a priest is required to, there would be no distribution of communion in the mass. Did you know this, Ray? I had heard that, yeah. Zero. He didn't even walk to the rail. And then there would be the end, the last gospel, procession out. Those who desired to receive communion would stay in the church yeah. after mass. Everyone else would leave. People would go outside, smoke their cigarettes, every right? Those who wanted to receive and were prepared would stay in the church. The priest would go back in with a stole on and surplus. And he would begin with the confidior and do the distribution of communion. And then those people would stay in church and they would pray and make a Thanksgiving and all that. It'd be kind of broken off. I was kind of shocked to read that. That's how it was commonly done at the parochial high mass. Not a daily mass or a private mass, but at the at the church's parochial mass. And I, I don't know if that's the right way to go. I'm kind of torn on it. I also saw in the 1939 Westminster London Holy Week schedule that on Holy Thursday, Monday, Thursday, and maybe another day, beginning very early in the morning, maybe it was 6 a.m., they would have distribution of Holy Communion, not a Mass, so that people could make their Easter communions early on. Because in the old days, you could not have water or food from midnight till communion. So if you went to Mass at 9 a.m., you could not have a sip of water. You couldn't brush your teeth. You couldn't have a snack. You couldn't have a cup of coffee. Nothing. No water, no food. That was the Eucharistic fast until Pius XII. In fact, Blessed Karl, the Habsburg, Austrian emperor, when he was dying, the priest came to get him to give him last rites in the Eucharist. And Blessed Karl said, I can't receive communion I had a fever in the night, and I I drank some water around 2 a.m. I broke the Eucharistic wow. fast. And the priest said, Blessed, or he didn't say Blessed Carl, uh, Carl, you're dying. You're about to die. You're dispensed. You received the Eucharist, and he received the Eucharist, and he died. Wow. So, I mean, think about that. If Because it's a, it's a pretty hard go, especially if you're going to an uh, 11 a.m. or 1 p.m. Mass. You would be expected to fast. So, I think, you know, for this reason... A lot of people weren't receiving communion, not just because they felt they were unworthy or they were in mortal sin. The Eucharistic fast was difficult. You know, I think that's something we're really spoiled with today because mm -hmm. this past Sunday, I was like, I'm not eating anything or drinking anything before mass. And after mass, I was like, let's eat, <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, it was a 10 a.m. mass. Uh, so it's, it's really, I think it's, you know, you, you hunger for it, you know, on, um, you're a big fan of the black fasts, right? Where right. you don't eat anything. And it's like, man, I look forward. I want to go to mass that day. <laughs> At least get to receive the body of Christ. Exactly. You know? So um, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, people might ask, how do I implement altar rail? Hmm. And that's, I, I might do a video on that soon, but because a lot of people are like, well, how could this be done? You can look at a lot of parishes. Uh, like our cathedral is, you know, it's a Nova Soto. Like there's never been a Latin mass said there or whatever. And it has, three rails, right? Where you could potentially have six people distributing communion, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully priests, right? Yeah. It's possible. Like even these churches in the round, I, I was at a church in Orlando, Florida, a couple of days after this priest told me to stand up for communion and uh, they used the rail and it was just an over sort of parish, right? Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, a round rail because the church was in the round, but everyone went and kneeled and it was, uh, they'd actually just built it. So yeah. it's possible. And uh, I think it's, I hope that in the next like couple of years, it really starts to gain some steam. Well, hopefully priests see this video and they say, well, I can't say it's slower anymore. You either got to yeah. <laughs> come up with something new. Um, I know, I know, I know. All right, here's a question. I, I uh, infant communion in the Eastern church thoughts. I think my daughter uh, got her first communion last Sunday. So yeah, it's actually, a lot of people don't know this, that in the Roman rite, and the Eastern Rites, originally, inf baptized infants received communion. St. Augustine mentions infants receiving communion. St. Cyprian mentions infants receiving communion. It was assumed everywhere that children were receiving Holy Communion. It was not till later on, probably around 1000, 1100, 1200, I don't know for sure, maybe Father Z can tell us here, uh, that children were no longer receiving communion in the liturgy. But uh, if you're baptized, 
you're in Christ. There is no original sin there. There's concupiscence, but no original sin. You have the Trinity living inside of you. And, uh, you know, I know of a child in our area who recently passed away after birth. And I heard that the priest, this is really beautiful. The priest went to the hospital. He baptized the dying infant. He gave confirmation to the dying infant. And he gave a drop of the precious blood to the dying infant. And the baby died. Wow. So the baby was fully initiated into the mysteries of Christ. Pretty awesome. So there's really nothing awesome. preventing a child from receiving. We just have this odd idea in the Western church since the medieval era uh, that, that children need to fully understand the Eucharist in order to receive it. But I don't fully understand the Eucharist. I'm all about infant <laughs> communion. I'd be for it. What about you, Ray? Yeah, uh, I have five sisters and a brother. So my youngest sister just turned nine, and uh, she was really excited for her first time. And I think that what it would do is, especially like if we were, you know, using the altar rail from a young age, you'd be like, "That's just what I know." You know, this is mm -hmm. this is Jesus. Before you get into, because uh, I mean, early and earlier they're teaching like disbelief in God, and you know how like science disproves the Eucharist and all these things. I'm sure to have received that from a child and to know that like, wow, this is really Jesus would probably give the the fortitude to persevere when you're being, uh, you know, asked. Right. Yeah. So I would, I'd be up for it. Yeah. It is cool. I, I did teach first communion, um, you know, Sunday school or whatever. And, and that was, that was a lot of fun. So I do see like the merit in it, mm -hmm. but I definitely don't think it'd be a bad thing to yeah. incorporate. Let's do one more question. By the way, the guy who asked this right. question is Catholicism. Do you ever you follow him on Instagram? I don't. He's I hilarious. Have to. Everybody go on Instagram, follow this guy. Catholic. I don't even know how you say this guy's name. Catholicism. Guy's hilarious. He has funny memes, Catholic memes. Okay. Um, let's finish up with this one. This is from Marcus Bewer. Bewer. I, I apologize if I'm killing it. Uh, how often should EMs be allowed for nursing homes and the homebound? Thank you for asking this question, Marcus. People, this is how people argue with me on this issue because I talk about it all the time. In fact, one of my blessings in life is that I get to emails from dozens of people saying, hey, I've been watching your video. I was a Eucharistic minister. At first, I was really offended by what you said. And I felt you were judging me. But then as I prayed about it, I realized, no, that's a good point. And I met with my priest and explained I'm not going to be a Eucharistic minister anymore. I get a lot of those notes and I'm, I think it's wonderful. Praise be to God. But people will come back at me and say, well, what about all the people that are homebound and the people in nursing homes and the people in the hospital? How are they ever going to get the Eucharist if we get rid of Eucharistic ministers, Taylor? And I say they'll receive the Eucharist the same way they People used to receive it for the past 1950 years. I'm like, well, how is that? Priests bring them Holy Communion. That's how it was always done. I was reading an old manual and it said that if, a, if you've been sick and not able to attend Mass, I think it was either three Sundays or four Sundays, uh, you have the right for a priest to come and visit you and bring you Communion. I was kind of, I was like, oh, okay, that was the custom. I don't know exactly the dates on that, but I was reading it in an old manual book. And I was like, okay, so that's, that's how this thing works. So if you were not attending mass for three weeks, four weeks, you could notify the church and the priest would visit you. It's important that a priest does it, by the way, because we don't believe just in the Eucharist. We also believe in confession. We shouldn't presume that because someone is homebound in a nursing home or sick, that, you know, Susan comes in with the Eucharist and gives them the Eucharist. What if they need to go to confession? This is why a priest should be uh, bringing Holy Communion. He can hear their confession and then he can give them the Eucharist and they're receiving all the benefits of being a Catholic. What say you, Ray? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. You know, I think that when you look at this, from especially w w with what you mentioned about some people just receiving, you know, six times a year and whatnot. W I guess in our in our view today, we think that receiving the Eucharist is a right. right. Like we have the right to do it. Yeah, and we should be doing but it all the time. But it's actually a gift. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I don't know if there's like, there's nothing super bad with that idea, but at the same time, we need to realize I, I get in this conversation a lot with like in vitro mm. having kids is a right. No, it's a gift, right. right? If we don't have the ability to receive Jesus because we don't have enough priests, then so be it. And maybe we need to have a conversation about how we need to, you know, increase vocations and, you know, desire for holiness so that there will be enough. Right. Um, it's almost like a, if, if we make an exception here, it's going to be an exception everywhere. Right. And that's, that's what I've seen with like everything in the church. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, can we have the tabernacle like on the side right. so the priest can be in the center? And it's like, well, just for this case, so that when he's saying the homily, he's facing the tabernacle or yeah. something like that, you know? Yeah. And then or, everywhere. Or you go to the nursing home. I mean, does the priest really need to carry a suitcase full of vestments? I mean, why can't he just, you know, put on an alb and that's it? You know, I mean, you do this and pretty much you erode Catholicism to all you have left is a Bible church, fundamentalist, ev or evangelical, whatever, you know? We we yeah. have standards and we have ways of doing this and solving these problems that are hundreds of years old. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and when and you I create new things like Eucharistic ministers, you create new problems that the wisdom of the church never solved because those things were never there before. Mm -hmm. And really, like, what does that do? I think that there's a Fulton Sheen used to talk about how, like, the priest was the priest victim. Right. Yes. It was like a twofold thing. And, and when I, when I think about that, like father John Holland was a perfect example of a priest victim, mm -hmm. right? He's literally like being a victim soul for, you know, those that, you know, have been sexually abused and, and the priest and whatnot. That is another way to do that. Right. If I have, uh, if I am a priest and like, all I do is, and I understand like everyone needs a vacation and, and whatnot. And like, we can't stretch them too thin, and, but we need, I think we need that challenge because, it's in seeing, it's in the people that are dying, seeing the love that priests have for them right. to come out to the nursing home. Because you almost look at this the other way. I'm like dying in a nursing home and my priest doesn't love me enough to go out to see me. That's maybe a more cynical way to look at it. But that's, I mean, I can, I can see people seeing it that way. You know, um, it's, it's really like the call to holiness that, that we all see. And then, you know, my family's going to visit and it's different when you see a priest and his cassock walking in like anywhere, you're like, holy cow. Yeah. Like, imagine what that, like the evangelization opportunities that there would be for Protestants that are at the nursing home, you know, families visiting, or you're going to someone's house because they're sick. My wife, you know, she had, we had to stay in the hospital. So the priest didn't come. So, you know, a normal like lady came and it, and it was just like, oh, cool. But like, if, if our priest would have came, like our pastor, that would have been amazing. Yeah. You know, yeah. like that would have been a really memorable thing that like my priest cared enough that like, you know, she had to get like four transfusions. So she had to stay in. And like, mm -hmm. I went to Latin mass, fortunately, but, um, he couldn't make it out there. So yeah. I should have asked our fraternity priest to come out, you but should've. I didn't. I bet he would have come. Out. I bet he would have come. come. I've been yeah. amazed. Our fraternity priests have not only shown up for us in crises, but for our family members who aren't even Catholic. When our pastor, I said, my grandmother is, well, she was a lapsed Catholic. She's dying where you go visit her. He visited her twice and tried to get, tried to save her soul, gave her the brown scapular. I mean, heroic good things that are happening there. I've also, one of the cool things about priests going to nursing homes and, um, and hospitals, especially in their cassocks to, to bring confession in the Eucharist is I've heard these stories from priests. They're so beautiful. Uh, They'll be ministering to someone in a room. Maybe there's another bed of someone and they'll give last rites to a Catholic person that's dying. And the person will say, Father, I'm not Catholic, but I'm dying too. Will you do that for me? Wow. And they'll say, are you baptized? I mean, they'll ask the questions. Are you baptized? Sometimes they're not baptized. They get baptized. Right? If they're not, they'll say, well, I can only give it to you if you're Catholic, if you profess the Catholic faith in danger of death. And they'll say, I, I profess it, <laughs> right? I mean, we don't know how the Holy Ghost is working, you know? And, wow. and there are people who in their final hours of life, it just so happened that they were in the same room as this Catholic where the priest came and that person, like a thief on the cross, gets saved. Wow. It's awesome. 
Wow. You know? That's amazing. So when a priest walks into a hospital so in the cast, and I've also heard from priests, I mean, I was an Episcopalian priest and this kind of thing happened to me where I'd go to visit someone and you can't even get to room 304 because people in room 298 and 290 are like, Father, Father, can you just give me a blessing, you know? And you and you mm. stop and you're just praying for all these people because there's they're in so much pain and they're in so much need and their souls are now open to the life of grace. So we are robbing people. Yeah, that's when... a, we are. And and that's a question that, you know how you go and, and it's like, well, anyone can give a blessing to anyone. And it's like, people no. say that. And I'm like, nope. no, nope. like that's not Catholic. If, if, if some that... random person, I'm like, how do they have authority? No. You know, <laughs> like, so, uh, even, even being a father, it's like very weird for me to like bless my kids because that's just like how I've always thought. It's like, it's the priest that does it. So if, if it's just in me, like, can you imagine the, the millions of people out there that would really benefit by seeing, you know, the priest in all black coming in yeah. and uh, people really, they desire that. Yeah. So hopefully my generation, when we're that age, will desire that as much as those, those dying now. So for sure. Well, good. Well, that's a show right there. Tell you what, thanks everybody who asked the questions and, and uh, those were, those are some good ones. And thank you, Ray. So, um, before we close up, we'll pray. Um, Ray, how can people follow you? I've got your Twitter on the screen there. It's Joy of the Faith. Your YouTube channel is Joy of the Faith. It's linked in the show notes below. I'll ask our moderators, Will and Dan, to also put the links in the comments in the live chat right now as well. Uh, awesome. Tell us more about what you do and how people can follow you, Ray. Yeah, so the Joy of the Faith is kind of, the, the original idea was to reach out to anyone, no matter where they're at. So like the atheist that only cares about science, which is why I was talking about the Shroud Trim video, things like that. You know, the, the fallen away Catholic, we got video, like videos like, why should I be Catholic? Um, you know, the, the hardcore Bible believing Protestant. So we've got apologetic videos and then just things about like our life, like the twins, we had a gender reveal, all these things. So kind of reach out to anyone. Uh, today I'm releasing a video on how to follow the Latin mass. So it'll be up in probably like an hour. Good. Uh, pretty much like literally like the mass and like what is being said and the priest is mic'd up. So you actually, actually hear him whispering. It's pretty amazing. So mm. that'll be really cool. But just, uh, you know, just subscribe on YouTube. That's my big thing. I'm on Twitter and Facebook too. So just check that out. And, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. In a couple of weeks, we'll be doing how to witness at work. So how to evangelize without being like super pushy, like, you know, your mm -hmm. classic Protestant, you know, yep. coworker, uh, and different things like that. So we try to mix it up and, uh, Show that, there, show that there's nothing or no greater life that you could have a more joyful life than being Catholic. So we are blessed. Good, good. Well, I like your videos. All the best to you on those. Thank and, you. and I want you to come back, man. We get, especially with some of these cool, All right. cool data videos come out, man. We need to, totally. we need to talk about that. So um, before we pray, I just want to encourage everybody, please like this video. That was a really good video. This was fun. I enjoyed it. Please subscribe. If, make sure you still are subscribed. Hit the notification bell. Um, if you want to listen to it on MP3, on your phone, download it, save data plan. Just go to Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, whatever. Search Taylor Marshall, that's my name, and it'll come up. Thanks to everyone supporting on Patreon. I'm signing a bunch of books this morning. Uh, Joy mailed, mailed out a bunch yesterday. So thanks to everyone who supports along there. And of course, as I always say, pray the rosary. If you're not praying the rosary, you're not, you're not on, on the, the team. team. Our lady got off her throne in 1917, came down to Portugal and said, pray the rosary every day. This is how we meditate on Christ in his joyful mysteries, his sorrowful mysteries, his glorious mysteries. This is a easy way. It's hard to pray for 15, 20 minutes. This is an easy way to pray for 15, 20 minutes and focus your attention on the works of Jesus Christ for us. That's what the rosary is. So you need to pray every day. Those that don't pray will perish, the saints say, so we must pray every day. And this is the training wheels of prayer, is the rosary. This is just getting into it. Otherwise, you pray at meals, you know, maybe in the evening you you review your life, do an exam in, and you say, forgive me, Lord, and maybe, you know, say a confidio or a small confession at night. But did you focus on Jesus? Did you spend time in prayer? It's hard to do. Rosary allows it to happen. So pray the rosary or you're not on the team. Okay, we're going to uh, close up with our Hail Mary and our Glory B. Ray, do you want to do the second half on these? I got it. Oh, you got it. Okay. Awesome. I always ask. 
I, I should explain this because some people say, why didn't you allow so-and-so to say the second half? And usually it's because I asked beforehand. They said, no, I don't want to do it. So I don't do it. It's not like I'm t allowing some guests to do it and some guests not to do it. I usually ask. And a lot of people know the Latin, but they're like, oh, I might get nervous and messed it up. So you do it. So that's why sometimes I do all of it and sometimes the guest does it. I usually defer to them. So Ray, you've got this. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostri. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Sicut eras in principia, nunc et separat in secula seculorum. Amen. All holy saints, pray for us. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody, go follow Ray and his wife at Joy of the Faith on Twitter and here on YouTube. The links are below. Have a blessed quadragesima, and we'll see you on Friday. We'll be talking about St. Robert Bellarmine and the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and Bellarmine breaking down the parts of the Latin Mass. Uh, well, it should wow. be a, a really good and informative show, so make sure you're subscribed, and we'll see you on Friday. Till then, Godspeed. Ray, thanks for being with us. Of course.